to start off by wow. I can't believe you are all so lucky to see Meryl Lederman Yukalis's work. She is truly an inspiration. Um, you've met other artists that I know, but um, when I was a little kid, uh, we grew up in Washington Heights and I told my mom at the age of six, I was gonna be an artist and everyone would say, oh, do you know Eva Hess? And Eva Hess was not alive anymore when, I, when people asked me that. So she was the first artist that people would always say, oh, you, you're gonna be like Eva Hess, which would have been great. And then I remember in the 70s, my parents moved to Riverdale, and I don't remember the first person that told me about Merrill's work, but I was blown away. Picture a college kid meeting this larger than life artist who had long blonde hair and wanted to save the planet. She was like, you know, you don't meet people like that often, and especially not in the synagogue you go to. So I want to say that, Meryl, I've told you this so many times. I still remember once in shul, we were on, looking at each other on other sides of the mechitza. It's one of my favorite synagogue stories. And you were having a show, I think, in London, and I was having a show in Minneapolis. And you looked. we both looked at each other. It was Rosh Hashanah. And I looked at her and I said, what are you doing here? And she said, what are you doing here? And both of us decided that we wanted to celebrate Rosh Hashanah more than the exhibitions that we were in. And I want to say, not only is Meryl an amazing artist, she comes from an extraordinary family. Her father was an amazing rabbi. She has an, had an amazing brother. Her husband is Jack Eucali. She has three extraordinary children. And the only reason I say that is, um, if you remember, when I was talking to Leonardo Drew, he made a joke about the fact that he never wanted to have a, a family. He just, you know, he loves children, loves all that. But Meryl, you did something extraordinary. You kept the person who you are. You have an extraordinary marriage and you have amazing children and you had such respect for your parents. Even the projects I know about when you moved earth around the world from where different people came from. I can't tell you how honored I am to interview you. I'm a little shy. I feel like, what am I doing doing this? But I don't know who I would tell you to do it better. So I want to start by saying, Meryl, and then we're going to look at all your work. She has 75 images, even more than Leonardo did. But we're going to go through every one of them. But I want to ask you the first question that I always love asking artists whose work I love. Why do you make art? <laughs> I told you I'd ask one wackadoodle one. So that's my question. Why do you do it every day? I mean, you're so gifted. You know, you get up in the morning. Why do you do it? When, when, I'm, when I'm making art, when I'm making work, I feel uh, completely alive. I think that's why. That, that's, I, I love that. That's perfect. Um, and then one other question, then we totally talk about your, you, but I want to hear from you some of the other favorite pieces of art that you've seen over the years that touch you very deeply. I don't care if they're living artists, dead artists, just some other pieces, you know, that when you look at it, you go like, wow, now that is something quite interesting. And I really, it stays with you works that have stayed with you over many years. Um, I, I, I'll mention um, uh, three artist heroes of mine. Actually, I love Eva Hess's work. I'm happy you mentioned how lucky to be in the same neighborhood with her. Unfortunately, she died very young, but she was such a great artist. Um, I was very um, influenced by Jackson Pollock. Uh, and I don't, I'm not mentioning specific works more about the break, the artistic breakthroughs that they, that they accomplished of he, he was able to create work with his body active in the art in the art making process itself that I felt was a gift open to artists forever after afterward. I was very influenced by Mar Marcel Duchamp because I, I always used to say Marcel Duchamp is my grandfather and some art students came up to me and said he really was your grandfather like, <laughs> but he but but his I 
again, I, I, I focused on the breakthrough of his naming, shifting names, uh, the, the freedom to take an object that had one use and move it so that we re-see it completely as an artwork. Like he opened up, th these are levels of freedom that these people gave as gifts to, to the whole world. And the final um, uh, great per person who influenced me was Mark Rothko. Um, I felt, I always felt that, that he made it possible through his paintings to move from one dimension into another. Just by standing there, you enter a different dimension. Another breakthrough in freedom, uh, in opening up human freedom. Um, those are the, the main people that I would. Now you notice the gender. So when I, I, I wasn't going to say garnished, I, I was going to be <laughs> garnished, garnished, garnished. Yeah, I, 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 I started with Eva Hess. You know, they were my heroes. I wanted, to, I wanted that level of freedom for myself. When I had a baby, I realized that they didn't change diapers. And I felt <laughs> like, oh my God, where am I? I felt like I was tumbling, falling, twirling. <laughs> So great. That's a great segue to the amazing lecture you're going to have. We're going to go through these images quickly, but we decided to put them all on because you're allowed to go back and see this program over and over again. I have to say that many people have told me, in fact, this week I was doing another class for you guys, and people said they looked at the, the Leonardo thing over and over again. So you, once you see these images, you are not allowed to download them, and that's why they're on a um, because they're they're property of of Merrill's, and that to me I think is a very important thing to state right away that artists' ideas are their property. It's like a building or like a car or like anything else that is their work. So I always get permission to show the work for educational purposes, but it's not to download and do something with it. So let's get started. So this is one of the pieces. This is where I want to start. Meryl, I picked this picture because I love this picture of you. You are always totally alive and present in every picture I've seen of you. And this statement that's written here is what we heard about in the beginning. So read this bottom. It's important for me that you read it. No portion of this lecture, images or text may be reproduced either in print or electronically without the expressed written permission of the artist. Thank you. Now we'll have fun. So this is the manifesto of maintenance art, art in 1969. So I want to show that image. And then I want Meryl to talk about that for one or two minutes. I'm going to be very strict Good. because there's so much to see that I just want Meryl to get started because this is groundbreaking. I uh, struggled for many years to become an artist. Um, in, in college, I, my major was international relations and history, and then I started all over again, accumulating, uh, uh, go, going to several different art schools uh, to be an artist. If, I, if anything uh, uh, impeded my uh, focus on trying to be an artist, I, I moved away, I walked away. Anyhow, I, I, I mentioned these heroes. I, I felt that art was freedom. And then out of choice and blessing, Jack and I had a baby. And, and of one example, um, when I was pregnant, I was at NYU in graduate school uh, getting a master's degree. My teacher, very famous sculptor, I was his best student. He saw me across the room and I was finally showing that I was pregnant. And he said, oh, I guess you can't be an artist. And it, it was a, a, a great 
Now I'm sorry I didn't walk over and punch him in the mouth. <laughs> you should have. Like, you should have. <laughs> but but that I I had entered a different world and and I was I felt like I was quite lost. No no levels of support. Um, and and then uh, I had an epiphany. People don't often have epiphanies, but I really had one. I realized that if I talk about freedom and I'm the boss of my freedom, then I call maintenance art. In other words, I name, like Marcel, I name the things of my life that I'm in right now, I call maintenance art, which was like a contradiction, uh, uh, a collision of freedom and necessity. And and I said, this is my life. I am the artist. Art will have to change, not me. I am who I am. And I have the right and the freedom to name the art that I make. And, my, and I accept um, how difficult and how complicated the boring, repetitive task work of maintenance and that enabled that epiphany enabled me to open my eyes and see many, many, many people, maybe most of the people in the world, trying to survive, get along, doing a lot of maintenance work. And so I this, oh sorry. That, that's so I said um, that basically that uh, that's what the basis of the manifesto is four pages. Uh, one and a half pages is a proposal for an exhibition called Care, where I would take over a whole museum and and the first part would be personal maintenance. I would take care, I would take care like the maintenance work of the museum. The second would be societal maintenance, asking people, what do you have to do? What do you have to do to stay alive, to keep going? And what happens to your dreams? And what happens to your freedom when you have to do that kind of work all the time? And it would be like a sound opera flowing down the stairs of people talking about what they have to do to stay alive. And then the third and fourth floor would become a site of transformation where the degraded materials of the planet, of the city, garbage, degraded air, degraded water, degraded earth would be brought to the museum and the museum would be, become the fulcrum, like the shifting place where things were transformed from degraded back to health. So actually uh, it's a spiritual idea. Of, so of this, this idea of, this, of the power, we have the power of transformation to go from degraded to health. Um, so that that is this manifesto that has sort of fueled my work ever since 1969. So that's what I wanted to say, Merle. This is so exciting because not every artist starts in one place and then you can see the work over 50 years that it really moves on. So we're going to go through some of the images quickly, but I didn't stop, Merrill, because I thought this is so important. This is life-changing, not only to her, but to everybody who sees her work. Let's get, go now to some images. So this was a project. Um, I remember this project, and it's so powerful because you see, first of all, I, lo I love that bell bottoms were in then. <laughs> and, and now bell bottoms are back in. So I like the way things happen in life. So talk a little, let's see these three images and then you'll talk about that idea of cleaning. This is such, these are the most amazing images that I've used in my class at SVA. I teach visual thinking and I talk about what does this actually mean? So let's start with this image because I think this image is so profound. I, t I, I spent many hours doing uh, a task that is always done behind the scenes 
at night when the people, the main people in the in the museum, the culture goers are not there. The place is cleaned. I washed all the main steps of the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum. And I'll show you some other places of uh, uh, washing pieces as well. So um, yeah. You want, go let's go to some of the other ones. Let's go to okay. some of the other, yeah. I was invited uh, by Yona Fisher. This is a photograph of Yona Fisher who recently passed away, great curator in Israel, uh, to, do, to make up uh, two performance works when I came uh, I was at, in Israel for the bar mitzvah of my nephew, my uh, Toby mentioned my brother. They came on Aliyah in uh, 73. And, um, and, and I came with my family to my nephew's bar mitzvah. But while I was there, I, I was able to do these two performances. One was a cleansing work, a, a washing work. You see me, wa I'm washing all the boundary areas of the museum, the, the main entrance. And then the next, um, the ne the next uh, picture is between the library and the, and the mu and exhibition spaces. Now, what I love about this work is that they go back one, one slide also, Toby. You yeah. see the, main the maintenance worker standing there in the middle, the woman holding a mop. She, she stopped me and she said to me, you're not doing it right. And she took me by the hand and be, I got my mat washing materials from the head of maintenance of the Israel government. Well, this guy hadn't done real maintenance for a very long time now, he was a big boss. And he gave me the wrong materials. And as I'm washing, I'm getting the, the glass greasier and dirtier. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And this woman, Malka, she came over to me. She said, you're not doing it right. These windows, my windows. And she took me by the hand, dumped out the soap that was bad, dumped out the rags and filled it up with water, brought me back and watched me approvingly as I cleaned the right way. Again, go to the next the next slide. Again, another, I, I was so moved by, by the maintenance people in the museum, had such um, uh, uh, demand, uh, uh, thought so highly of their own work, of the importance of their work. Uh, they didn't give a damn who was doing it, what was there, photographers, people. They wanted the work done right. It was I, I, I love that so much, Meryl. One of the things you always did, and I'm going to show you, you're going to see those images later. I followed Meryl when she did a project with the sanitation workers in New York, and I took tons of pictures. And I remember all the people saying to me, I can't believe she's doing this. Like, this is so cool. She doesn't have to do this. And I think that is why, Meryl, you got everyone who was there so interested because you took a job that you didn't have to do and you gave it dignity. And I think that is so profound. Let's go to the next one. This is another uh, washing piece. This was in, in front of the old AIR gallery, one of the first feminist art galleries in Soho in 1974. I, I lined that man leaning over and the man looking at the pay. I lined the area that I said I was going to take responsibility to wash as art uh, for many hours during the day um, was a quotation from Rav Cook. Um, saying that the, that the profane pulls, uh, the holy pulls the profane up into itself, that people are becoming closer to nature. And I love that quote. And that was what formed the boundary of the area that I said, I take responsibility for cleaning this area as art. Now the problem, I got into a problem. I brought, I had saved sheets, old sheets from my apartment a few blocks away and I tore them up and they, and the, and the Soho was very, it was quite industrial in those days still. And the sidewalk was eating up the rags. I was running out of, I was committed to do this for many hours and I was running out of rags. So, so I didn't know what I was going to do. Okay. 
Wow. I, I love this. I remember this yeah, image. Dirty. It was so dirty. And I didn't, and I kept, and I was bent over cleaning, cleaning, saying, what am I going to do next when there's nothing left of these rags of them? I grabbed a mop head, you know, I was, I was in so much trouble. And then a miracle happened. A Isn't that a beautiful image? I love that image. This man is a superintendent from a, a factory across the street, not in the art world. And he saw he had been watching me for quite a while. And he and he didn't he didn't come over to me and say, What are you doing? Why is this art? What is this about? He brought me this big pile of industrial grade rags, which were fabulous. <laughs> All he said to me was here, a gift. And it, it changed my life. What I did was, we didn't talk. That's what he gave me. He said, here, we, uh, I, I took the rat. I was so moved. He walked into the art and changed it and changed me. And, um, that let, let's go to go to the next to the next i took his rags and i wrapped them around i wanted to incorporate his gift into my body and actually i did he entered right into my soul that i realized it was like a door in my art opened up that the art could be open so that others could come right into the art itself as part of the makers of the art. That's what that man did. He didn't ask, he just came in. And my work from that point on changed and opened up to include other others in making the art itself. You should know, Meryl, when I was in graduate school at, at, um, at, uh, at Pratt, Tom Pugliafito, I don't know if you even knew him, he used your uh, work of using other material because it was called, the class was called Material Culture in Art. And it was about how material changes the way we make art. And he used Rauschenberg, he used a lot of different artists, but he also talked about the way you took things and turned it into art. Yeah. Let's go to the next, yeah. So um, I ended up, uh, getting in, I did many performance works dealing with maintenance, and then I was invited to be in a, a group show called Art World. You see the invitation that I, I made this invitation. Um, I had been looking for a skyscraper to maintain. It's very hard to find one, and they don't necessarily want you messing around in their building, you know. But the Whitney had a branch on the second floor of this one of the largest skyscrapers in Manhattan, 3.5 million square feet. And they had 300 maintenance workers. And I thought, wow, this was what I've been looking for for a long time. So I wrote a, an invitation to 300 maintenance workers that keep this building going day and night. It's a Richard Meyer building, very, very Tony where the, the maintenance workers are not allowed to even speak to the, to the public. They're like silent apparitions that keep everything perfect all the time. So I, I moved through the building um, and I, I, I practically lived there. Um, uh, I worked at least an eight hour shift, often a 16 hour shift like they do. And I had a Polaroid camera so there wouldn't be any negatives. And I, and I a approached a person and I said, may I take photograph you while you're working? And, and, and they said, by and large, I think they all said yes. And, and then I, the, the Polaroid picture came out of the camera. I don't know if you all remember those early Polaroids, but they had this little uh, uh, white space at the bottom. And I made uh, labels. One label said maintenance art and one said maintenance work. And I, I had invited all the workers to consider one hour of their regular work 
maintenance art if they decided to do that. And I never dis discuss what they should do. Um, but I, I photographed them. I showed them what they had just been doing. I focused the camera. I showed them what I had chosen to show of them working. And then I said, is this maintenance art or maintenance work? And whatever they said, I, I put that label at the bottom. So that here's Vanilla, this lady on the right, who said to me when I met her around one o'clock in the morning, I've been waiting for you for weeks. And she took me with her dusting, cleaning, wiping. And the, the best part was that the workers started coming to the museum. The curators told me that they never came to the museum. The, the museum was for the people, you know, like the fancy office workers or the outside people. They yeah. were just there to clean and, uh, you know, keep the building perfect. Amazing. Um, but they started coming to the museum and uh, some of them said to me, you got it right, but you missed this and you missed that. I love, they were very, very critical. <clears> that they, they read the art very closely. I just, I love, that's my favorite thing. If someone pays attention to the art and, 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 and talks about me and says, well, what is that? Why did you do that? Why that way? Why not the, another way? So there, there they are coming over, over the course of the exhibition, um, there were 720 images of, of choices. The point of this artwork that I came to understand as I was doing it, sometimes you don't, you just kind of say, this is what I'm doing. And then after you're in it, you begin to really understand what you're doing. They were the decision makers. I focused the camera, but they completed the image by saying, this is what you're looking at so that they entered the work just like the super did to say, this is it, this is what you're looking at. They renamed as Marcel did. I was just gonna say that. The, the, the I, I, I felt like you love Marcel Duchamp. This makes me think of Paris Air. Like he took Paris Air and brought it to New York in a little beaker. You <laughs> gave voice, you gave voice to all these people that have no voice. And once you show them that they exist, it's very, very powerful, really powerful. Let's go to the next. And I see now the Marcel Duchamp connection really well. This I adore. This is the great image of it. This is the, this is the finished work. And, <clears throat> and now it was, a, it was acquired by the, by the, the main Whitney Museum uh, for their permanent collection. Um, it was in a wonderful show called An Incomplete... Um, history of, of um, activist art or something like that uh, just about two years ago. And now it has to go to sleep for 10 years because they're nervous about the Polaroids, the inks of the Polaroids lasting. So it sits in the dark for 10 years and then it can come out again. <laughs> so this is the show that I had the privilege of working with you, Meryl. Really was one of the greatest moments of my young artistic life when you <laughs> called me and said, I said, you know, I'd love to work with you. You said, Are you good with the camera? And I said, I'm studying with Roy DeCarava. I'm good with the camera. And she goes, Okay, take your camera. Tell them what you did. This is unbelievable. So I spent a year and a half doing research. I was uh, uh, someone, David Bourdon wrote a review of the piece that you just saw about I Make Maintenance Art. Uh, in the Village Voice, and it was the height of the fiscal crisis in New York City. The city was just about almost, almost, uh, many people thought it should go bankrupt. Uh, 60,000 jobs were removed from the workforce. That's how huge the, the crisis was. Uh, into this difficult atmosphere, I spent a year and a half um, he said, what about sanitation? Its budget was cut. 
maybe if they could consider their work performance art because they do it out on the street and replace their budget with a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. I sent a Xerox of this review, art review and they called me up from the commissioner's office, Commissioner Vaccarello at that time and said, how, you know, the, the review will talk about me making art with 300 people. This, the, the, the commissioner's assistant, Francis, said to me, how would you like to make art with 10,000 people? And I said, I'll be right over. That was in 1976. And um, I'm, I'm still the artist in residence there, now sort of long distance back and forth. But I designed, after talking to sanitation workers and hearing them talk about how people, people think we're part of the garbage. It was so stupid. It was so ridiculous that here they are out in public and, they, and people said terrible things to them right out in public. Very, very hard job, very hard job, especially a lot of the trucks were collapsing during the fiscal crisis. And I decided this is just stupid. And I, and I, you know, I'm not a corporation and I don't, what am I going to do? And I said, I'm going to go face each person. I'm going to shake hands with each person and say the truth. Thank you for keeping New York City alive. I didn't say thank you for cleaning New York City because that's their job. But I, I said a m bigger thing, like thank you for keeping the city alive. So that was my proposal. That was the only thing I thought that a person could do. Um, like, let's get over this. This is so ridiculous. Okay. So let, let's see these images. These are these are amazing images. I, w I went everywhere. Go, go back a second. This is me walking around in the landfill. Um, the old days. Now all these landfills are have gone through environmental closure. Um, okay, go, go ahead. Um, I love this picture because I'm looking at him, but he's looking at the camera. He understands very well. He's saying to people, look, you look at me, you look at me like that. I just love that. I love that. Here, uh, you know, I had, I spent the whole eight hours uh, at least with it, with these people. And there was a lot of fury and anger uh, that people were were expressing like why why do people think of this about about me um i heard hard things this is in staten island at six o'clock in the morning um i i made the more i heard people the more fiery speeches i gave that roll call about we have to change this you're part of life you keep the city just like women for thousands of years have kept the home, the interior home. You are the people that keep the city. You keep the city as home. They, they were, Meryl, since I was standing there, not as the artist, but as just a documenter, they would walk away after you shook their hand. And for this alone, I'm happy to be doing this interview or conversation they felt like you were the Lubavitcher Rebbe or something. Like they had shook hands with one of these great people. They all said the same thing. And I remember over and over, is she serious? I said, she's totally serious. She goes, but she just thanked me for cleaning and taking care of the city. And does she mean it? And she's gorgeous. And why is she even talking to us? And I said, she's an artist. This is what she does. And it was amazing to watch because it would happen. And then, I don't know if... It, other times I'd come, I was more than one day that I spent with her. Then everybody knew about her. And then people would come ready to shake her hand. It was like, it was like after Yontif with the Lobov, everyone knew the deal. Tell me, then, tell me, tell me stuff. Right. Well, pe people would say like, what is she like? And I'm going, you're going to actually meet her. You're going to find out for yourself. And they'd go like, she's so serious. She always looks me in the face. She looks at everyone in the face and she shakes everyone's hands. She doesn't look if we have blisters or anything. They were transfixed by you. Let's go to the next one. That, that yeah. 
These are great images. They're great. I did um I did a thing called fo a follow in your footsteps where I copied them. That was the beginning of a kind of a choreo work choreography that turned into work ballets, which I'll show you show you later. The, these final two pictures I, is, is sort of like the essence of this work. I was saying a person always has the freedom to say no, always. But the, the, now move to the next slide, to please, please. Yeah. But a person always has the freedom to say yes. Poteach et yadecha, open your hand. Such a great theme in Jewish religion that we talk about the divine, open the divine, open your hand, that we have that power also. Um, that I felt that we have to build a coalition between among service workers where their work is so necessary, but that it's part of the culture. It's not behind or downstairs or not to talk or don't talk about it. But it's what makes the culture. How silly that that people don't feel don't have that feeling that people understand what I'm doing. Well, you made the invisible visible, and I think that is such a profound thing. And all the work you've done from early in your career until yesterday, I think that's your greatness: is that you take things that we see all the time but we don't notice and that it doesn't become part of the vocabulary. You go into a museum and everything's clean. I'm always fascinated when you go into museums and you talk to the guards and they know so much about the art, but they're usually invisible. And I think what you did was an amazing thing. Let's go to the next one. So this is a, st a store. People told me many, many, many stories. Um, this is the next, uh, this man, we were standing in the garbage. We were in a landfill. He had just dumped his load in the landfill. He said to me, 17 years ago, it was very hot. We stopped for break. We were in Brooklyn. We sat down on this lady's steps to get, to get a break. She op we had loaded her garbage into the truck. We had just loaded her garbage. She opened the door and she said, get away from here, you smelly garbage men. I don't want you stinking up my porch or smelling up my porch. And then he said to me, this stuck in my throat for 17 years. And today you wipe that out. Now to me, that was the best thing that ever happened to me as, a, as an artist, that the art worked. And then he said something else that blew me away. Then he said, will you remember that as if I was like, I was like blown away. And he thought, eh, maybe she, she'll forget about it in five minutes. Doesn't mean anything to her. So I made a performance work for that man, for that story to show that I didn't, I didn't, I did remember that. I didn't forget that. Here he is. That's the two of us. Now, this is the Ronald Feldman Gallery at 31 Mercer Street in Soho. And I, I wrote a, a permission. I all had to get many, many permissions from headquarters. I sent out a telex all over New York City. Tell me the bad names that people have called you out on the street. And we got back many, 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 many names, many names. And then I had uh, artists and, and uh, preparators paint the names uh, on these 75 feet of glass in front of the gallery. And I rebuilt the lady's porch right there. So that, and, and these are families of sanitation workers who were invited to come witness, witness the members of the public wiping out the bad names, wiping them away, cleaning them. Here you see that they, they built um, two levels of scaffolding in front of the in front of the gallery. Here's Lucy Lepard, wonderful curator and art thinker, and um, um, a, a head of a foundation 
a kid, 190 people washed away those bad names. You should read what Lucy Lepard has written about Merrill. She's one of the most brilliant thinkers and she's written amazing things about you. They, they, this is Helene Elon, who, who passed away, uh, I think, to, for, of COVID. She was one of the first victims of COVID um, uh, washing. By the way, I showed her work in when I showed great Jewish artists. She was in the panel. If you remember the first week I showed, she was one of the artists that I showed you. Yeah, she was a dear friend. Me too. Good friend. And she thanks you, Meryl, for telling. Uh, there's a great story that she told me about you, that you had thought about doing something with an actual Torah, erasing things. And you said, no, 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 do it in a book. And that book was then shown at the Jewish yeah. Museum. She said, she told me about her, If it's a very famous work now. Right, very famous. I she, showed that work. She, so all of you who saw the work on Sunday, that's the work I showed. He covered uh, the a Torah with a, a vellum so you could see the words through. But with a pink marker, she, she crossed out the words that she found um, uh, insulting or not loving. Um, but when she told me about this work, that she was going to take a Torah and cross out the bad names in the Torah, I said to her, Helene, do me a personal favor. Don't write on the Torah. Even though that Torah would have been what it was called Pasul, that it, it, it was, it really wasn't. Uh, uh, oh, sure. Yeah, wasn't usable. It was, wasn't usable. But I thought that people who would respond to what you want to do would for, not be able to get over being insulted that you were sort of attacking the so, so she listened to me. I was very, very happy she about it. She always that. gives you credit. She was a good friend of mine too. And she's told that story many, many times. So I did not see that image. I didn't know that she was there. Let's go. This is another great one. So I made, I made a, um, you know, the, the way these work, I made a proposal, uh, it was a natural. Once I started learning about the sanitation department, it was just a natural. Of course, cover a garbage truck with mirrors and then you will trap the image of people in the mirrors who prefer to think they don't make garbage, that the garbage is the fault of the sanitation workers. But with the mirror, you get them. It's me. It's me making this garbage in this in this truck. So it took about six years to convince the department to actually, you know, take a truck. And um, it was uh, the the excuse was I was invited to do the grand finale of the first New York City art parade in 1983. That was at 42 blocks down Madison Avenue. So that was like an excuse that they could use. Oh, well, we're going to be in the grand finale. And they borrowed some super's working garbage truck. And he never, ever forgave me because <laughs> he never got it back because this is used today. It was used in the parade for the Canyon of Heroes. It's used all these years since 1983. And it's, it was shown in front of the Queen's Museum. There it is in the Queen's yeah. Museum. That was amazing. I remember, Meryl, when it first went down in front of the museums on Madison Avenue. I remember when you had the whole sweeping thing. Right. Wait, go back for a minute. I want to talk about this for a minute. So Meryl had an amazing show at the uh, Queens Museum that got rave reviews in the Times. Holland Carter wrote about her as one of the greatest living artists, underrated, like it was like the most beautiful review. And I took our kids there, Meryl. I called you afterwards and they were blown away. There were so many selfies. I always think about what images do people take selfies in front of? This was one of those unbelievable ones. And I laughed and I said, you know, you're doing exactly what Meryl wants because you're the one who's making the garbage. And now you're right. photographing yourself in front of the garbage you're making. But this was a brilliant piece that people loved for so many reasons. And I like that it got a life of itself. As you said, it, it's such a, anyone who knows this image thinks of you right away. Uh, uh, and it was a great entrance to your exhibition. 
This um, this is a, a piece, a mikvah, Place of Kissing Waters. This is a show I was in with Toby, a group show of every once in a while, the Jewish Museum would have a show of contemporary artists, Jewish themes by contemporary artists. Go, go back, go back a minute. So the, I, I, I did huge research on, on mikvah. What do you, what do you need? What is, what is uh, uh, that you absolutely have to have to have a proper mikvah? You have to bring God's waters down. You collect God's waters and bring it into the mikvah. And I, and I got the, uh, pi these pipes um, that were beautifully painted by an Asian, wonderful Asian artist who worked with me. Um, that, that shows the collection points. You don't, you don't seal the joints. They're, they have to be open. It's just so, so many beautiful ideas connected with, with the notion of mikvah, of purification that, that, that Jews have had for thousands and thousands of years. So here we are on the outside of the museum. And then the next image is showing the bore, the collection pool that collects um, collects uh, the God's waters from the rain on the right. And on the left it are uh, 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 an organization of pipes that bring city water into the bore. Why? Why? This is... I think one of the greatest ideas of mikvah that shows the most creativity among the rabbis. And what is that? That they didn't say to people, wait for the rain. You can't continue with your life if, you're, if you uh, uh, need to purify yourself for uh, many reasons. You don't have to wait for the rain we will take city water that people have invented to purify for the city and kiss it. That's the technical term, kiss it with God's waters in this collection pool, the bore. And then you see this blue and white pipe. That's the same pipe that brought the waters from up on, on the roof that come, that bring the waters into the, the, the mikvah, the immersion pool itself. There was a sound work of, of uh, water also that, that went with this. Okay, then the next, and here you see a, a plexiglass um, a staircase. Each, each step faces a different direction because the purpose of immersion is to be born again truly to be to become a new person that's that is what the religion is saying the the mikvah this this kissed waters of human culture and god's waters imagine in this immersion pool you enter one way and you emerge as a new new human being. And I, all these tiles are imported French tiles. I found the most beautiful tiles I could find <laughs> to, make, to make this, uh, this image. It was a great piece. It was a great, great piece. And the, and the stairs, um, each one faces a different direction. I wanted that to sort of be like, you're changing, you're changing, you're preparing, you're ready, and then you enter into the water. Let's go to the next. This is a, this is a, you see the collection bore underneath the floor. You see the bathtub, you see the moon. Um, you know, I made a connection between the, the, the phases of the moon and a, and a woman's monthly menstrual cycle. Um, of, there are four of them, you don't see, see them. But this is the whole, the whole. Um, the, ne the next piece is called Shvirat HaKelim, Birthing Tikkun Olam. 
and that was commissioned by the uh, for the opening of the new building of the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco in 2008, I think. Um, there's a, this comes from a Kabbalistic story that in the beginning, the divine was everywhere. The world was the divine. And the divine made a choice to constrict the divine. Perhaps the divine was lonely to make room for people and animals and birds and plants to have to be in the world. And the world was composed of perfect vessels. And when the divine constricted the divine by called symptom, self-limitation to make room for us to be in the world, to have the world, a fiery light burst out and it was too much for the vessels and they shattered. And all the pieces filled with this original light were lying around broken on the ground. And our job as creatures of creation are to bring the, the shattered and the broken and repair what is, what is shattered back together again, that we, receive the power of creation from the divine, the same power that created the world in the first place. And we, it is our job to bring the heal, repair the, the, the brokenness in the world. So I made all these hand mirrors and I wrote a letter to people uh, coming to see this piece. Look in the mirror. The person you see is unlike anyone else who has ever lived in the world, and you are sacred. You possess the, you possess the power of creation that comes from the original creation of the world. I invite you to enter into a contract with me that if you say, I will use my power of creation, I will sign a contract and I will describe a project that I will do out in the world to heal the world. I will use my power to heal the world. Then the mirror does not belong to me anymore. It belongs to you. So these contracts were taped to the back. People wrote things, drew things, and then the contract Here's a person looking, looking in the mirror, one of the guards in the museum, by the way, that, that Toby talks about it being invisible. I, 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 I love this piece. Guard, a wonderful guard, wonderful man. And on the backs of all these hand mirrors, there is a contract that's folded up. Um, and when the, the, then there were series of, of performance events where the mirror was actually unhooked from the artwork and handed, it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the person because of their commitment. And here you see at the end, um, the, the mirrors, except for the top row, because I just wanted you to see them, <laughs> that, that you see all these commitments from people to do an act of healing an act of repair. And on the, sh on the shelf, there's a shattered crystal uh, glass uh, with, a light, with a light in it. I, I, well, I'm so happy we spent time on that because those mirrors, I remember them also from the Queens Museum. When you invite people that are not visible to be visible, they never forget it. And I had many students at SVA and from the Artist Beta Midrash, somebody from the Artist Beta Midrash is here in this lecture and there was somebody else who's a doctor and I bumped into her at your thing at the Queens Museum and she sat in her chair, she said for over an hour because she just felt so great that she was being looked at not only as a doctor but as a human being because you didn't know who she was. Yeah. And I think there's something very powerful 
that when you go to museums, very often people feel intimidated. And what I think you do so powerfully is you include them and say your voice is just as valuable as anybody else's. So now, yeah, this is great. The snow work is going. How are we doing? How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. We have twelve minutes, uh, ten minutes left, and then I want some question time. Okay. Um, so we're being careful. I'm being careful. Yeah, I was I was commissioned uh, to uh, to make an artwork in uh, Echigo Tomari in northern Japan, um, and I propose making a work ballet. What's amazing about this place? way up in northern Japan is that they have among the highest snowfalls of the whole world. Every year there's about 12 to 14 feet of snow. And the, 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 in the town, in these towns, the first floor of the town, of the buildings, it is drowned in snow. And without the snow workers, these very courageous, brave people, with fabulous machines, they dig out the houses so that people can actually stay. If they didn't do that, they couldn't live there. So this is one of the drawings. Each driver of the 13 vehicles had a, a, a whole package of the, the different moves that we had worked out together. And I must say, when I do a work ballet, I don't, I refuse to, uh, design something in advance. Like the, the people that invite me always say to me, send us the design and we'll practice before you get there. And I say, no, we start from zero. We do it together. We create together. And it's a little hair raising because they only give me several days because I insist they, that they get paid, which means that they'll only give me about three or four days to work with these people because it's expensive. But, but we start from the beginning and we make, and we make that you see, uh, I drew and my translator drew, uh, wrote in English and I wrote in, in um, I wrote in Jap Japanese and in English. Okay, let, let's look at the, ne the next one. See that the, they have these magnificent rotaries that dig through that, these spirals. They look like sculpture to me. They're just fat. Japanese make wonderful designs of everything you can imagine. And th this had a funnel that would blow the snow and this big plume away from the building, away from the street. Um, these are three of the fabulous workers. This is um, the, the dance of the rotaries and here are the people on the, uh, for the performance. I said, I said to them when I met them, I bet everyone in the winter loves you. Is that true? And no one spoke English. Then I had a translator. They translated it. Everybody nods. Yes, in the winter, everybody loves me. And I said, I bet in the summer, they forget all about you. Is that true? Yes, they nodded. Yes. I said, well, next summer, let's remind them what you do. So these were choreographed work moves of the different kinds of trucks uh, from these fabulous drivers um, that we designed together. And, and, uh, and, and, and during the, uh, when we were first designing it, I thought, you know, it's good, but it's not good enough. There's something where it's something missing. And I said, we have to tell a story, some kind of story. And I, I just, it just came to me. I turned around and I said, do you know the story of Romeo and Juliet? And they translate and, and people nodded. They knew the story of the, the young lovers whose families hated each other, who continued, you know, even though they, they, they were in an environment where the families hated, hated each other. So I said, how about let's make the, the tragic love story of Romeo and Juliet which we did with two bulldozers. One was Romeo, one was Juliet, and the others were all different parts of the ballet. And I just have two images of, of the two of the lovers. The, by the way, the guy who painted the blades, like 25 layers of gorgeous paint, 
purple for Romeo and peach for Juliet was a detail expert for Toyota. Oh, wow. And he said to me, do you want this edge, this color or that? He was, it was just, they were just breathtaking. The gorge, it repeated the landscape in the reflection of the mirror. So here the young lovers approach each other and they kiss <laughs> and then they're destroyed by it. All right, let's. We gotta hurry now, Meryl. We, we, we gotta get. This is this is great. I love this part. So this yeah. is such a great image. So okay, so this is a picture from Touch Sanitation. I had been uh, uh, the whole night. Uh, this was the morning shift. I I, I was there uh, for a round robin, like sh rolling shifts, and uh, we were talking. And this is the the uh, uh, poster for the my 50 year uh, uh, survey show at the at the Queens Museum and what happens how do how did I advertise my work okay show the next show the next slide it went on the place on the garbage truck so thousands of garbage trucks and mechanical sweepers all over town drove around and invited people to come to this uh, exhibition at the at the Queens Museum and um, okay, the, here's another, I made a ceremonial arch honoring service workers. There are thousands and thousands of dirty work gloves signed, labeled from uh, 11 different agencies. And I made the columns of uh, emblematic materials from the subways, from sanitation, fire, police, transportation, the post office. And um, 50 work lights are embedded in 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 this uh, ceremonial ceremonial arch, also. So, Meryl, this is one of my favorite pieces you ever did, and I felt very complimented because I want to tell all of you that usually I do the entire. I pick every images for the artist that I'm doing, and Meryl and I went back and forth and back and forth, and they were images that she wanted, but there was one image I took, and she goes, "You know, the image you took of that." you have of that is very good. And I redid that one. But Meryl, the reason I love this piece so much is because it shows your artistic. It's so beautiful. Go back because this, I, I, when I look at this, I feel this is Kedusha. This to me is like hands reaching up to God. It is so beautiful and so powerful. And I made the chupa that I made for our children's, our daughter just got married and I made it for Nessa's and my wedding. And I've made many chupot over the years. And this to me feels very much like you took work and gave it holiness. And I think of the Kaddish Kaddash and the Holy of Holies. And it's just so poignant that you took things that exist. And I'm so happy you brought up Marcel Duchamp before because it's all things that are ready-made but you turned a ready-made into a Meryl Laterman Euclid's finished art piece. It's just, and at the museum, it looked amazing. Toby, I have to tell you, this, uh, the arch, this is the fourth uh, version of the arch. It was in Korea. The Brooklyn Museum, the wasn't it? It yeah. was in the in New York Public Library, the Financial Art Center in New York, but also in the International Expo, in Taejon, Korea, and 13 couples got married under this arch. So wow, it's a it was, chupa. You had that, you had that. <laughs> right under here. <laughs> Meryl, you and I have yet another thing in common. I love it. I love it. All right, now let's go to this. This is great. So this was a, a piece that one part is still open, uh, three different places. Um, during COVID, during the height of COVID. Um, the, this is snow emergency, red orange. They gave me, this is a Times Square, huge 150 foot high screen. Uh, I, the piece is two seconds long. So it starts with a, a, a two minutes long, I'm sorry. It starts with a, this emergency red orange. And then the next, then I drew, uh, it was a black screen. And then there was, uh, this is my handwriting as if I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you, dear service worker, Kate, thank you for keeping New York City alive for 
How long? For forever. Th this was at the height of COVID where people were dying, you know, and these service workers. And then this was the end of this two minute long, this um, uh, uh, safety vest, um, chartreuse uh, safety green color. These two colors frame the message that the two colors end up on people's vests. You see them now all over the place. That workers, it's the, these colors are saying, careful, this person is precious. Be careful, danger, like that. So the, the, these frame the, the um, um, and it was also in 2,500 screens in the subways, the same work. So you see the guard way in the background with his safety green vest. And then uh, splashed across the facade of the Queens Museum, the same message, which is still up. They, they, it is. It's been there for a year. Um, you know, the point is, it's, this is not gonna go away. This is for forever. If we're here, this has to be here. You have to see these people, how, how important they are. All right, let's go to the last. This is the last one. The last slide. Um, I have been, this is a site at Fresh Kills uh, that was a landfill where 150 million tons of garbage are buried over 50 years now closed since 2001, reopened briefly to accept the remains of the World Trade Center. Um, but one day it will be public, uh, public park open, open, fully open. It's not yet open. It's, uh, it's open on occasions or for tours, uh, but this is, a, I got a percent for art award in 2008 and I'm proposing to have a cantilevered overlook in this very beautiful site so that you can under this huge sky you can stand there and see transformation see human power of transformation that we can take a degraded site and return it back to health wow Wow, now let's, I wanna see Meryl, I want your face on here. Can we just get Meryl's face and I'll be one of the audience, but is there a way to do that? I wanna say, Meryl, this has been one of the best hour and 15 minutes. You accomplished, I think, a ton. You made your father so proud of you um, because rabbi's children, you know, you gotta always you know, feel like it's hard to be a rabbi's child. I think you became the rabbi. And um, you're teaching us so much about loving humanity. I see people shaking their heads. What you did for all of us, you gave us an hour and 15 minutes of pure joy. Your mind is exquisite, absolutely exquisite. And of all the artists you talked about, I think you have a lot in common of Marcel Duchamp about teaching us how to see ready-mades. What is it to have a ready-made? I will, and I know this from the minute I met you, every time I see a garbage truck, I think of you. I, and that is, you know, um, when they say, and you talked about um, uh, Rothko, and I think about that also. I always think about, you look at a page of Talmud, and I look at the page of Talmud, and I think about Mark Rothko's, the way he has things moving, you know, the, the Mishnah, the Gemara, and everything else. And you have really changed what people think about if people keeping New York alive or keeping anywhere alive. Um, I love that somebody wrote that was fabulous talk. Thank you, um, Meryl. I don't even know how to thank you. I, I was very nervous when I called you and I, I don't know if you know this, but there were four people I asked and I asked you, Meryl, you're the one I want most, which Tuesday do you want? And you said, I'll get back to you. And then you said the 10th. And then I called Leonardo and I said, Leonardo, Meryl's on the 10th. He goes, oh, put me before Meryl. I'll be on the third. Uh, but I want you to know you're, you're an inspiration. You're an inspiration on so many, so many levels, not only as the amazing artist you are. And I studied with Rosalind Krauss and Lucy Lepard. Your name was always in the conversation. And I remember as a young artist, I always felt like I know her, like I know what she does. And 
as years have progressed and when I talked to Sherelle and, and, and I heard that she immediately said, oh my God, that's one of my, you're maybe the 50th person that has said it to me because Meryl's in all the lectures I give on and what she does for the art world. So if there's one or two questions, I know we're late. Um, the most amazing presentation. Wow, thank you for saying that. I agree. Meryl, you were fantastic. You should feel great. Thank I'll you. call Jack and tell, but wait, you know what I want to do? I want everybody off mute for a minute. And I'd like you to clap for Meryl. So oh. can you do that? <laughs> ask everyone to unmute. Unmute. I want that clapping loud. I hope Jack is in the room. Yashika. Yashika. Is Jack in the room? Amen. Amen. Anyway. So much. Inspiration. I'm, uh, is Jack there? Jack, are you there? Come here. He's right here. He, it, 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 he's, he's part of everything that well, I, I do. I know. That's why I asked him. I believe Ishto Kagufo and everyone has a Azer Konegdo. Jack, I want to say I've told you this every time I ever talked to you. Thank you for being the amazing partner to one of the great that's artists true. in the world. That's and true. you should ship so much nachas. Please tell all three of your children, who I know well, that their mother is, oh my God, a genius. <laughs> and I know what a good mother you are, and I know what a good wife you are, and I admire you from the bottom of my heart. And Jack, I don't know if you remember the first time I told you, I went like, she's so cool. And you're still so cool, Meryl. You are so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Toby, I've heard Meryl speak many, many times. And I must say, you did a fabulous job of bringing out the best in her. Thank you. You well, really. I'm, I'm a groupie. That's why I can do it. You know, if you love somebody, you uh, you try your hardest to show the world why you love someone. And I think, Meryl, I I've told you this so many times. It's so boring that you're just an inspiration. You are really a great. And I love how seamless you bring in God's water. I mean, you. You're giving a drush on. You're bringing Rob Cook, who's one of my favorite all-time people. Rob Cook, like, hello. Greatest <laughs> guy. He gave that first lecture for the Batsalel group. I'm sure you know this. I love that lecture he gave from the first year at Batsalel. So he would be proud of you. <laughs> well, I want to I thank Meryl immensely and thank Toby for bringing to us these amazing people and sharing with us um, these, each one is a full world. So thank you very, very, very much for this beautiful session. Um, and I'll just say we have more coming up with Toby. Join us on Thursday for the second virtual gallery tour. And on Friday, we have a first session of kind of mini Kabbalah Shabbat with Toby, a kind of way to inspire you for Shabbat, looking at Toby's uh, own artwork uh, this Friday, revolving around sacred space. And you're more than welcome to also check out our website to see all the upcoming programs uh, that we're having this. Yeah, this may, I, may I say something? I, I have spoken many places in this world and, and ha had a person invite me many, many places. I have never been treated so graciously like Toby has done. So I, I, I feel like crying. I think you're the best. I feel like I, I feel like I had um, Eva Hess or or uh, or Giacometti or you know one of my faves and you're here. And what I like about you, Meryl, I have to say it in front of everyone, I love that you have a personal life. I love your children. You raised three exceptional children. And you and I have talked about this. I think if you decide to live a Jewish traditional life, there are things that you give up because you want to have that personal side of your life. And, you know, I was supposed to do pre de Rome. I was supposed to do many things that I decided not to because of my family. And I look at you and Jack and your amazing kids and I think to myself, you did it all. You know, you're an amazing artist. You have a family, you have a life. And, you know, when I called you, you said, you know, our family's doing something for Yom HaTzma'ot. Like, I, I love that. I mean, that you, that you have a life. And I, I want to say this about all four artists that I'm showed you, all four. 
not all of them are totally different, totally different, but they all have a life. They all are doing great things for the world in different ways, but they all believe in, I, I, the word is also tikkun olam, of helping make the world a better place in very different ways, but they all are real people. And I'm excited. I thought about it this morning. I next want to do great art historians and curators who do that. Um, and so I think we're in a, in a great time. So Meryl, thanks again. Jack, thanks again. Um, Thank Sherelle, you. I'm happy I made you happy. And that's <laughs> you, you, yes. to work with. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely Thank you. a dream come true. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you in more programs. Have a good day and good night, depending on where you are in the world. And Meryl, thank you again. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank this you. Wonderful so. session. Thank you, Toby. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.